when we see several computers around in the market, the natural question which comes up is which is better and which is worse. Particularly in the terms of performance, uh, which performs better and uh, which performs uh, poorly. Also, as uh, a designer, if you look deeper into how uh, instructions are organized and how uh, computer is designed, uh, the question is that with so many different alternatives, which alternative is better from performance point of view. So, in uh, this lecture and uh, the next one, we are going to look at the issue of performance. We will define what exactly this term means and uh, uh, what is the relationship between performance and architectural choices. So, uh, the issue of performance, the question can be asked from a user's perspective. Okay. Uh, a user may like to know about uh, performance of the computers which are available and uh, designer on the other hand may try to see from the point of view of design alternatives what is the best. So, for both these uh, perspectives, what you need is a basis for comparison. How do you compare one versus the other, one computer with the other computer or one design choice with other design choice. And uh, this has to be a quantitative metric. So, you should be able to say that uh, A is two times better than B or uh, three times better than C and so on. So, so, quantification is a must and therefore, a precise definition is required. So, uh, although initially I will talk of uh, user's perspective as well as designer's perspective, but uh, particularly what is relevant for this course is that we try to understand the relationship between performance and the architecture. So, from uh, user's perspective or a, or a purchaser's perspective, suppose you want to buy a computer system for your lab or your organization or for yourself as a personal computer. Uh, you would find that there, there is a lot of variety. Okay. Uh, there are different manufacturers, different vendors and uh, for uh, each vendor, you will have a set of choices. Okay. There is a range of machines. So, the question you would like to ask is, how do they compare performance wise across the vendors or within the machines of same vendor and uh, what is the cost implication? Because uh, if possibly as it is intuitive, you may not get performance without any cost and which indeed is so, uh, that performance and cost may often be uh, having some trade off. So, you put in more cost, you can get better performance or you want to save money, you will have to settle with the lower performance. So, uh, is there a way of putting these two together? You may like to ask the question of what is uh, the best performance for a given rupee? Okay, what is the performance price ratio? Okay. So, so, which alternative gives you best performance for the same price? So, there are different ways you can pose this question. On the other hand, from designer's perspective, we have seen that first of all, there are so many different types of instruction sets. Okay. We have uh, talked about some major styles, load store style or uh, memory memory style, stack style, okay, uh, accumulator type of machine. So, there are different philosophies of designing an instruction set and also something which we have not studied, given an, given an instruction set, there may be different, many different ways in which you can build the hardware. Okay. Uh, so, you, you can do the instructions in such a manner, you can execute them in a manner that they take less time or more time and uh, there are implications of those choices on cost and performance. So, uh, once again uh, among the different options which you are considering at any stage either at instruction design stage or at hardware stage, what gives best performance okay? and what is the cost implication. So, you can similarly ask the question of uh, performance for a given price. Okay, you, may, you may fix the price and uh, see what gives you best performance or for a given performance, which is the uh, cheapest option. So, so you could work, work it out different ways. So, uh, the study of performance uh, has several aspects. One is the question of, uh, of course, you need to define what performance means in very quantitative and precise terms and they, they should be 
uh, a way of measuring the performance. Okay, it should be a measurable quantity. So, uh, how how to measure it? How to report it? How to summarize it? Because uh, uh, measurement may involve uh, maybe several experiments. And uh, can you come up with a, a summary number, a, a number which summarizes all that you do as an experiment? And based on all this, how to make good choices? Okay. So uh, it, it may not, as I mentioned, that there, there are two issues involved: performance and cost. So you have to make a judgment. Okay, which is the best uh, alternative? Uh, you might see that. Uh, people who are trying to market a system may try to project certain things. Okay, so there may be hype about uh, this machine uh, does this, this uh, does this, and uh, this is a performance number. Uh, but you have to see does this match with your uh, definition, and uh, your, your your definition may possibly take into account your requirements. Okay, so so you have to have. Uh, an evaluation or a definition which actually reflects the way performance is going to affect you particularly. So, uh, this, uh, this understanding of performance, uh, method of measurement, method of summarizing, method of comparing is, uh, is important from the point of view of understanding various design choices which you will study as you go along. <coughs> Okay, so, uh, we, we would like to understand why a certain piece of hardware or certain design choice uh, performs better than the other and uh, uh, we will also see that it may depend upon the program. Okay. It, it may happen that uh, uh, A performs better than B for a given program, but for another program uh, it may be better. So, for example, you know you might find that when you are doing word processing, A is better than B, when you do emailing, B is better than A. Okay? So, so, those things may happen. And uh, which uh, factors influencing the performance are related to hardware design okay? or uh, which performance factors are related to architectural issues. They, they may be factors which are uh, also beyond this. Uh, be beyond the processor design in particular. So, we would like to get some idea of that also. Uh, and uh, uh, what, what is the influence of instruction set on the performance? Okay. Uh, including or not including certain instruction, uh, does it have influence on performance or uh, instruction style has some influence on performance? So, all these questions are there and we, we should develop a certain understanding of uh, these questions. So, uh, to uh, bring some basic points uh, into attention, let me take an example from a different domain. Okay, we, we are talking of all the computer performance, but the issue of performance could be seen in daily life in uh, many different contexts and you would see that there are parallels between what we see in this problem and what we would see in computers. So, here is a set uh, some data about a set of aircrafts. Okay. The first column shows uh, a set of aircraft which for example, an airline may be uh, debating which one we should buy okay. and uh, the, the choice may have to be dictated by some kind of performance comparison. So, uh, the first three columns give certain data, okay. ignore the last two columns for the moment. Uh, the first uh, this column second column says what is the speed uh, of the aircraft okay expressed in miles per hour here uh, what is the range in terms of miles uh, for which the aircraft can go before refueling okay the third is the carrying capacity in terms of number of passengers so if you look at these three parameters you would find that uh, it it's not a very simple matter of telling uh, which has the best performance. If you simply go by speed, Concorde has the uh, maximum speed. All right. So, if, if your target was speed, then Concorde is, is the plane you must buy. Okay. If you want to look at for example, uh, the range, okay, you, are, you are interested in uh, uh, long flights without any stoppage in between. 
Okay. Suppose you, you, you want to connect two airports which are 8000 miles apart, then uh, your choice is DC 850. All right. uh, others cannot give you a non-stop flight for that distance. Then on the other hand, if you are talking of passenger capacity, okay, you, you want to carry uh, let us say uh, 450 passengers at a time, then your choice is uh, Boeing 747. Right? Uh, others will have to make two trips to do the same thing. Uh, so, so this is uh, th th this is just to indicate that depending upon how you fix your targets, what is your uh, area of interest, what is uh, what is it you want to achieve, uh, or what your application is, you might find that the the performance would be different. Okay, with, with uh, one given criteria, A could perform better, with other given criteria, B could perform better. Uh, so, in the in this particular column, for example, you are seeing the time taken in hours to connect two points, let us say across the Atlantic, uh, which are say about 4000 uh, miles apart. Then the number of hours you would take is given here. So, so, this is another measure, which is nothing but inversely proportional to the speed. Okay. So, again Concorde is the best one here. Uh, you, you could also look at something like throughput, okay. uh, number of passengers carried into miles per hour. So, so it is a it is a kind of composite uh, measure of the carrying capacity and the speed. So, if you multiply these two, uh, the figures you get are shown here and uh, from this point of view, uh, Boeing 747 is, is the best. Okay. Uh, it is it's a combination of uh, capacity and, and the speed. Okay, so, uh, another thing which uh, this uh, example uh, brings to our notice is that there are multiple criteria, okay, multiple notions of performance, particularly from context of computers, there are two notions which uh, we, we would be talking of. Uh, one is the time. Okay, so in uh, aircraft context, it is the travel time. Uh, so for computer time would mean response time, or execution time, or latency. So for example, to be more precise, you may ask a question: How long does it take for my job to run? So moment I say run, it takes certain amount of time, uh, and that's what is of concern to me. So other question could be how long does it actually take uh, to run, how, how much time the processor has actually taken to run. Okay. The, the first one is uh, the, the time I see on the wall clock. Okay. The second would be the time uh, a machine has taken to execute uh, the program. Uh, third would be for example, in, in an interactive environment, let us say database query or uh, ATM type of environment, where you, you give a command or you make a request and you get a response. So, what is the response time? In different context, uh, you, you may like to ask questions, you may like to word it differently, but uh, you are talking of basically time in seconds or minutes or hours or whatever it is. Uh, the, the other type of uh, measure is called throughput. So, again it is a generic term, where we are trying to talk of the overall uh, work which is being carried out, the rate at which work is be being carried out, number of tasks per unit time, okay. how many jobs can the machine run at once, what is the average execution rate, how much work is getting done. So, uh, you as an individual user may like look at time as an important factor, but let us uh, uh, put ourselves in the shoes of a computer system manager okay, uh, who is catering to a user community and the concern there would be. Uh, how many user programs are being run every hour. Okay. Uh, it, it is secondary that uh, uh, a user may have to wait or uh, a user may get immediate response. So, each individual user may see his or her own response time, but, but as, as a manager of a service, one would like to see how many uh, programs are being executed by a collection of computers or a single computer as the case is. Uh, 
per hour or per day or whatever the unit of time you choose to be. So, uh, th this uh, these are two measures which sometime may go together okay, or sometime they may contrast with each other. Right? Uh, you, you may for example, find that uh, in order to get high throughput uh, some waiting times are introduced. So, some people have to wait uh, and uh, while others may get quick access, but some may have have to wait and maybe different people have to wait at different times, but uh, on, on the whole uh, your attempt is to keep the machines busy. Okay, so, that may maximize throughput, but uh, as an individual you may like immediate attention and you may like to get complete grasp of the resource. So, it may not necessarily lead to better throughput, uh, but of course, there, there are suppose you have you replace all computers by better computers, it may improve response time it may also improve throughput. So, so some, some changes or some policies or some uh, uh, design choices may help both, uh, whereas others may help one at the cost of other. So, one has to keep in mind uh, what is objective. So, uh, the, the question may be when is throughput more important than execution time and vice versa. Okay. So, it, it depends upon uh, perhaps the person who is asking the question. So, now let us try to uh, define performance, uh, we, we will try to focus on the, the time aspect okay, and uh, not the throughput aspect, uh, we, we will uh, predominantly talk of the individual concern of uh, response time or execution time. So, uh, we want to define performance in a manner that uh, a bigger number, a larger number represents better performance. So, so we could define it as a reciprocal of execution time, right. So, we say that performance is uh, 1 upon execution time. So, performance of let us say machine x uh, is 1 upon execution time for x. So, so you take a machine, you take a program, see how long it takes, uh, measure it and then say reciprocal of that is your performance number. right? So, it is a very simple and straightforward definition uh, and uh, this can be used to also talk of relative performance. So, you want to say x is n times faster than y okay? or x is n times better than y in terms of performance, then uh, basically what you are saying is n is the ratio of two performance numbers, performance of x or performance of y and in terms of execution time, it is reciprocal of this ratio, which is execution time of y over execution time of x. So, you, you have you take same program, run over two machines A and B, uh, measure the time and take the ratio. So, that gives you relative performance. So, for example, suppose machine A runs the program in 20 seconds and machine B runs the same program in 25 seconds. So, how many times a is faster than B or how many times B is faster than A? So, so it is the ratio of these two number, uh, A is uh, uh, 25 by 20 times faster than B, which is uh, 5 upon 4 or uh, uh, 25 percent faster. Okay? Or you could say uh, B is uh, 0 0.8 times faster than A, which means effectively you are saying it is slower than A. Okay, now, uh, coming to the aircraft example or airline example, uh, you could compare the time, time of Concorde versus Boeing 747, right. You could uh, take the ratio of uh, speeds one way or ratio of the travel times in the other way. So, you could say that Concorde is 1350 mph divided by 610 mph. So, you take this ratio which means 2.2 .2 times faster or in other words, it is 120 percent times faster than uh, Boeing. Alternatively, you could take ratio of the travel times. So, 6.5 hours divided by 3 hours. So, now you have taken the reciprocal ratio, which will again of obviously give you the same figure. Uh, one could also have <coughs> compared throughput. Okay. Suppose, we, we define 
uh, throughput as we did in the chart as persons or passengers carried multiplied by uh, miles per hour. So, uh, you take the ratio of uh, this p m p h figure passenger capacity multiplied by speed and so this is for Concorde, this is for Boeing. <coughs> so, Concorde is 0.62 times faster or alternatively you could say Boeing is uh, so many times or 1.6 or 60 percent time faster than Concorde. <coughs> so, so it is now faster in, in throughput sense. All right. Whereas, uh, the first comparison was faster in speed sense or travel time sense. So, uh, we, we will be focusing uh, on uh, the, the first one of these that is the time, okay? because that, that is uh, what is that, that is of uh, concern to an individual and uh, uh, the, the current discussion which we will have on architecture would be uh, more closely linked with that. So, uh, when you understand the question about performance, uh, you, you may like to uh, ask, understand and ask questions like this, that uh, in order to improve performance, you, you may consider a change like upgrading a machine with a new processor with a faster clock. What will it improve? When you, you have a machine, you, you take the processor, replace it with a uh, faster processor. Okay. I mean same let us say uh, Pentium 4 uh, with 2.8 gigahertz is replaced by Pentium 4 with 3.0 gigahertz. So, what changes the the throughput changes or response time changes? Bo both will both will improve. Okay. Increasing the number of jobs, uh, suppose you, you have a system uh, which is which, which is running a sequence of jobs. All right. uh, so, imagine that pe people come with their programs, uh, run it and go away. So, increasing the number of jobs, what will it improve? Response time or, or throughput? It will obviously improve throughput. So, the, if, as a policy, if you start taking multiple jobs, try, trying to run them in time shared manner, uh, it would improve the throughput. In fact, it can slightly reduce the response time because of there may be some overhead of uh, switching from one to other. Okay. Overhead of uh, doing time sharing may be there. Uh, on the other hand, if you knew that there is no time sharing, uh, processor has to just take one job as it comes and finish it, uh, then you, you are not incurring some overhead which otherwise you are incurring. So, response time actually could deteriorate. Okay. So, suppose you, you are in a lab environment where there are couple of machines, five machines are lying there. If you add a couple of more machines, wh what does it improve? Response time or throughput? Certainly, throughput will improve, more jobs can be done. Uh, there, there could be, uh, from if you are counting from the time you are on the machine, of course, the response time does not change. But if you if you look at the total time you spend from the time you step in the lab and you go out with your work done, uh, that may improve because uh, with less machines and more students trying to do it, you may have to wait in front of the machine. Okay, so so uh, some something will improve here in terms of time as well. If you're talking of total time you have to spend in the lab, uh, that could improve. But, but the time which a processor takes to execute your job will not uh, change uh, if you have 5 machines or 10 machines or 50 machines of the same type. Uh, if you uh, let us say in a network of ATM machines, if you increase the number of processors, okay, then uh, suppose there, there are number of uh, uh, network of ATM machine which are controlled by certain number of processors. If you increase the number of processors uh, which are working at the back end for uh, supporting these ATM machines, uh, what will happen? Will you improve 
throughput or will you improve response time? It will improve both. Okay, it will improve throughput. Right, Mo more machines are there to do more jobs, but uh, again, somewhat in similar analogy to the lab, uh, your your waiting time waiting time may get cut down somewhere. Right, because uh, you you may fire a transaction on ATM, but uh, processor is busy, so it, it waits for a time, waits for a while. But if there were other processors would uh, take care of your transaction, it could respond faster. So, uh, continuing with uh, this uh, such kind of practical question, now suppose you have two processors, two machines from different vendors say Pentium 3 and PowerPC, uh, if one takes 8 seconds and the other takes 10 seconds, it is clear from what we have discussed uh, which one is faster, okay. uh, but could there be reasons to buy the one which takes longer? Yeah, there could still be reasons. It it may be costing you less. Okay, so so you you have to see uh, performance not in isolation, but at what price you're getting what performance. So the the cost factor cannot be altogether ignored. Uh, in uh, let's say again going back to the aircraft situation, the the Concorde would be faster. Okay, if you are concerned about the travel time, uh, but then ticket may be more expensive. Okay. So, if you have a uh, uh, budget, limiting budget, uh, then you have to make choice accordingly. So, it may be uh, your task may be to get best performance for a given cost or, or uh, if your target is a particular performance, you like to see with what minimum cost you can get the same performance. Okay. So, now as I mentioned, we will focus on uh, time aspects so and not so much on the throughput aspect, but even time issue could be fairly complicated depending upon how you view it. So, uh, you, you could have response time which, which is the total time taken by uh, CPU to do the job okay, plus time which uh, for example, disk may take to access files, uh, the time your program may be waiting for. Okay, it may wait for some input output to happen or it may wait for uh, some other tasks okay, um, in a multi tasking environment uh, there may be wait involved. So, the, the time which you see ultimately is sum of all these. Okay, on the other hand the CPU execution time uh, would be the time which CPU actually spends doing your program. So, it will exclude the disk access time, it will exclude the waiting time. And uh, this itself will be consisting of uh, the time which has been spent actually executing your instructions, uh, because there will be a component of uh, OS instructions. So, there, there, there is OS overhead, uh, OS is doing some uh, service for your program, okay. it loads your program, it takes care of IO, it takes care of uh, uh, communication. And uh, so, some overhead which uh, OS incurs is attributable to your program. So, so strictly speaking the total CPU execution time is uh, uh, some of these two, the, the time spent on user code and time spent on OS code and that part of OS code which is executed to serve your program. So, from uh, um, there are many factors which influence these. Okay. So, we are not talking of OS design, uh, we are not talking of uh, so much of peripheral design at the moment. Uh, if you if you are concerned with the, the processor architecture, okay, then what this will influence is essentially user CPU time A and also of course, uh, to some extent uh, OS time, okay. but OS time will also be depending upon what kind of OS you are writing, what is the OS uh, scheduling policy and so on. So, our immediate concern would be the uh, user CPU time that means, uh, you, you have user program and how long a CPU will take, how long a given architecture will take to run that program. 
So, uh, as an example to clarify these points, let us say uh, a CPU time for a given program is 22 seconds with uh, sorry the, the OS component of the CPU time is 22 seconds, uh, user component is 90 seconds. So, a total CPU execution time could be 112 seconds which is sum of these two and uh, with memory time or disk time and uh, waiting time all put together the time could be total 162 seconds okay, which is uh, 112 plus some uh, other time which is 50 seconds in this case. Now, uh, having said that we, we, we are looking at uh, the time CPU spent in executing a user program. Okay. So, we, we like to break it down further uh, and try to express in terms of the clock periods. Okay. As you know that uh, all processors run with a clock, okay. when you say a processor is running at 2 gigahertz, that means there is a it is running with a periodic signal at the frequency of 2 gigahertz uh, or uh, half nanoseconds cycle time. So, uh, this uh, 2 gigahertz is the rate at which events take place within the processor. So, any hardware activity in the processor will take place at uh, discrete edges uh, at which clock changes state. So, the clock cycle time or the clock period is a reciprocal of the clock frequency. So, for example, if uh, clock frequency is <coughs> 200 megahertz, the cycle time or the clock period is 5 nanoseconds. So, relating the time to execute to cycle time, we could say that uh, the CPU time is uh, CPU clock cycle into clock cycle time. So, uh, sup suppose you cycle time is 1 nanoseconds and you are executing 1 million cycles for doing something, then 1 million into 1 nanoseconds is how much? Uh, 1 millisecond. So, CPU will spend 1 millisecond of time. Uh, alternatively, we could say that CPU time is CPU clock cycles divided by clock frequency or clock rate. Okay. Same thing because clock rate and cycle time are reciprocals. Uh, it can be further rewritten as uh, CPU clock cycles uh, depend upon uh, how many instructions are there in a program and how many clock cycles are taken per instruction. Okay. So, the, the product of instruction count and CPI which stands for cycles per instruction. So, if you know these two figures, you can multiply these two to get the idea of uh, the number of cycles which CPU takes to run a program. So, uh, with that we can write CPU time equal to instruction count multiplied by CPI multiplied by clock cycle time or clock period. Alternatively, CPU time equal to instruction count multiplied by CPI divided by clock rate or clock frequency. So, uh, units of these quantities can be very easily uh, seen in this equation. <coughs> CPU time let us say we are talking of seconds. So, second CPU time in second is equal to uh, instruction count which is instructions per program. CPI is cycles per instruction and clock rate is seconds per clock cycle. So, you could see dimensionally how this is balanced. Okay. Instructions cancel with instruction, uh, uh, cycles ca cancel with cycle. So, what you get is basically this should be seconds per program okay. on the left hand side, uh, seconds required to execute a program or seconds per program. Okay, so, so let us uh, uh, illustrate this with an example. Suppose you have a processor with clock rate of 50 megahertz. How do you find execution time for a program which has 1000 instructions and given that CPI for the program is 3.5. Okay. Uh, now, you, you might wonder when I am talking of cycles, everything happening in cycle, why I am why am I talking of a fraction here? So, uh, it is uh, a fraction because we are talking of average and I will elaborate on that little later. So, let us take this value. 
and uh, try to find CPU time in terms of these instruction count multiplied by CPI divided by clock rate was the formula we just saw. So, substituting the value instruction count is 1000, CPI is 3.5 and clock rate is 50 megahertz or 50 to 10 to the power 6. So, uh, you can multiply this and get uh, 70 into 10 to the power minus 6 seconds or 70 microseconds. Okay. So, now suppose uh, we have situation where uh, everything else remains same and clock frequency increases. Okay, I asked this kind of question earlier. So, suppose uh, in some case clock changes from 200 megahertz to 250 megahertz, other factors remain same. So, how would the time change? Uh, so, obviously, uh, time which is dependent upon three factors, others remaining same, when you take the ratio of uh, old time and new time, others will cancel out and basically you will get the ratio of inverse ratio of the clock rates or uh, direct ratio of clock periods. So, 250 megahertz by 200 megahertz or 1.25. So, old time and new time are related with this ratio or that is uh, new time old time is 1.25 times the new time. Now, coming back to the point of fractional CPI, uh, uh, as I mentioned that uh, CPI uh, as we have put there is average because the time taken, the number of cycles taken by different instruction may be different okay. uh, and, and the reason for that would come from the way we implement the hardware. Okay. You, you may notice that hardware takes uh, longer for some instruction and uh, shorter for other instruction. So, given that we need to find an average. So, so CPI uh, is a essentially a weighted average of CPIs of individual instructions. Suppose uh, there are n different instructions or instruction types and we know CPI of each individual instruction and what we need is a weightage F i which is how frequently this instruction is up, uh, occurring in a given program. So, uh, as an example, suppose we have uh, these five instructions, uh, or rather there, there are five categories of instruction, arithmetic instructions, which are present 50 percent of the time in a program. That means, uh, half the instruction in a program are uh, add, subtract, multiply, divide of that category. 20 percent of the instructions are load, 10 percent are store, 20 percent branches and this of course, totals up to 100. The, the CPI is different for these. Let us say for ALU instruction, CPI is 1, ALU stands for arithmetic logic unit, uh, instruction which do arithmetic or logical operation. They take 1 cycle, load takes 5 cycles, store takes 3 cycles branch takes 2 cycles and uh, then weighted average can be obtained by uh, this formula. So, we find C p i into f i instead of percentage I am taking fraction while computing this. So, 1 into 0 0.5, this is 5 into 0 0.2, this is 3 into 0 0.1 and this is 2 into 0 0.2. So, now if you can sum these and you get 2.2. .2. So, on, on the average an instruction spends 2.2 cycles uh, for its execution. So, interestingly from this you can also find out uh, what is the fraction of time CPU would spend doing ALU instructions, what is the fraction of time CPU will spend doing load instruction and so on. So, <coughs> that also uh, could be found out from this data and is shown here. Uh, how will you find this? What formula have I used? Can you figure out? The CPI into F i for that entity divided by total <coughs> CPI. Yeah, so, so ba basically uh, uh, if you if you take this as a total, okay, what fraction 0.5 is of 2.2? So, 0.5 is 
23 percent of 2.2, this is what I am saying. Uh, 1.0 is 45 percent of 2.2, 0.3 is 14 percent of 2.2 and so on. Okay. So, uh, it, it gives you an idea of uh, where the processor spends time. Okay. In this case, it is very clear that such a processor will spend maximum amount of time doing loads. And, uh, and if you were to figure out how to uh, write a program in an efficient manner, you, you will try to, you will keep your attention on minimizing the loads. Okay, so, uh, here is some explanation of why some instructions take more time or what kind of instructions take longer and what kind of instructions take shorter. So, for example, typically, although in this example, we grouped all ALU instructions together, but uh, there would be many situations where multiplication and divisions will take longer than addition and subtraction. Okay. Uh, now, between integer operations and floating point operations, floating point will take longer than integer operations. Memory accesses take longer than accessing registers. So, if, if a processor has uh, two instructions for adding one picks up operands from memory, one picks up operands from register, obviously the one taking from register will be faster. So, uh, when you uh, change your cycle time, Okay. So, suppose you, you are trying to redesign with faster clock, uh, it, it can also have an influence on uh, the number of cycles, because uh, number of cycles required for doing an instruction uh, depends upon how much work you can do in one cycle. So, if you make the cycle faster, you may take more cycle. Right? So, so, let us say multiply operation. So, there is some work to be performed and uh, how you divide into cycles would determine how many cycles you need. So, if you if you make your cycles longer, okay, uh, you, you can do more work per cycle and therefore, number of cycles may be less and vice versa. But uh, what would eventually matter is, is, the, is the product of uh, clock cycle time, the period multiplied by the number of cycles. So, so you, you cannot just attempt to uh, pull down one quantity and hoping that other will not change. So, one change can influence the other and one has to see the composite effect. So, uh, now coming back to uh, the this formula, seconds per program is cycles per program multiplied by uh, second per cycle. Okay. We, we of course, had uh, divided this into uh, instructions per program multiplied by cycles per instruction. But, but uh, now, for the current discussion, if you look at this, so to improve performance, everything else being equal, you can either do something to the number of cycles for a program. Okay, you can uh, reduce the number of cycles for a program, right? Or do something to the clock cycles. Okay, you, or you can reduce this seconds per cycle or uh, equivalently you can uh, increase the clock rate. So, uh, these simple equations can uh, tell you very easily uh, which way you must make a move, uh, but if, if your changes uh, are influencing, if, if a change which you do influences more than one factor, then you have to see the composite effect. Okay. You may be improving one, but you may be uh, doing worse in the other. Okay. So, uh, for before closing, let me just uh, <coughs> present an example to you. So, it is a, uh, it looks a complicated statement, let us go through it gradually. So, there is a program which runs in 10 seconds on computer A okay, and the computer has a clock of 400 megahertz. So, now we are looking for another design. Okay. We want to help a computer designer build a new machine B, which will run this program in 6 seconds. So, ultimately we want uh, performance to be improved as far as our program is concerned. So, the designer can use new or perhaps more expensive technology to substantially increase the clock rate. 
but has informed us that this increase will affect the rest of the CPU design causing machine B to require 1.2 times as many clock cycles as machine A for the same program. Uh, what clock rate should we tell the designer to target? Pardon? Okay, how did you? Un the answer is giving is 800. How do you get that? Sir, the number of cycles is 1.2 times. Uh, so, the clock rate should be given as 800. Uh, so, the time taken equivalently should be 12 seconds. Hmm. So, the uh, speed should be doubled to reduce it to 6. See, uh, you, you have to look at these things. Uh, where did it go? <coughs> okay, so so these are the uh, values given for first case A and uh, the the time. Let me write it separately. Let me raise this. <coughs> okay, so so we get uh, ten seconds. <coughs> by executing n instructions with certain CPI with the clock rate of 400 megahertz. Okay. On the other hand, we want to get 6 as a time, same number of instructions. Okay. We are talking of same program. Uh, we are assuming that no instruction set is instruction set is not getting changed. Okay. If instruction set changes, this figure would change and uh, what we have been given is that uh, CPI is 1.2 times the old CPI. So, C into 1.2 and uh, divided by a frequency of f megahertz. Okay. So, so, given that uh, you have to find f. Right. So, uh, what you will get is f is equal to one point two times four hundred multiplied by ten over six. Okay. So that's the formula effectively used, right? Uh, and you will get eight megahertz as the answer. Sorry, eight hundred megahertz as the answer. All right. Okay. Any questions about this? We'll stop at that. Same thing. When you said system means operating system. So, the question was what is the difference between uh, system CPU time and OS overhead? Both are one same thing, just worded differently. Any other question? Okay, thank you.